Hello, we are live from Glasgow. My name is Shauna Sylvester. I am the executive director of the SFU Morris J. Wask Center for Dialogue. And this is our daily briefing, um, a daily digest of things that are happening at COP and a focus on cities. So it's great to be here tonight with you. Um, after our technical briefing, Jude Krasta will join us for a fireside chat. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our new Minister of Environment and Climate Change, Minister Stephen Guibault. Mr. Guibault is no stranger to the COP process. I believe that this is your 19th COP, Minister? Yes. It is, Shauna, yes. And you have had such a long tradition of working on climate change issues over 25 years of working in various capacities, Equitea, Greenpeace, in many different capacities on, on a range of environment issues, but a real focus on climate. Is that, I think I have that. Is that is correct. Yes, you have that. Well, I can't think of a better person to host us tonight in terms of helping us understand this process, taking us through, giving us a bit of a sense of what to expect and what's coming down the line. So the first question I wanted to ask you really is um, as we've looked, today is day two. Uh, we had a chance to look yesterday at some of the highlights of the first day. This is the second day of the Leaders Summit. What are some of the things that you think that Canadians should know about what's going on at COP today? Well, first, uh, Shauna, thank you so much for, for having me on. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to, to be here and to be talking to through you uh, to people in, in, in municipalities across across the country, who, as we all know, are, are at the forefront of, uh, of the fight against climate change and, and the solutions uh, we, we need to put in place to, to, to face up to, to, to this great challenge. Um, I, I think what this morning uh, there was a... Um, a very interesting event at which I had a ple the, the pleasure of, of attending. Uh, the Prime Minister was uh, one of the speakers. In fact, Canada was, was co-hosting this event um, in, in collaboration. Uh, the Prime Minister of Sweden was there, the President of the European Union, as well as the leadership of the IMF, the World Bank, and the WTO to talk about global carbon pricing. Um, as we know right now, about 20% of, of the world's emission are covered by various forms of uh, various systems of, of, of carbon pricing. 20% um, is better than 10% or no percent at all, but uh, it's not enough. And, and the prime minister uh, this morning made the proposal, and I, I think you could see it as a global challenge really, to, to try and reach by 2030 60% of emissions that should be covered by, by a carbon pricing system. Um, uh, why? Well, because we know that it's one of the most efficient way of reducing emissions. And, and, and there's a great level of interest in, in what Canada's doing on, on this front, especially amongst developing countries who some of them might, might want to put in place a carbon pricing system, but the, the fear that they have is that their citizen will bear the brunt of, of the emission reduction. Uh, if, if they do that, the Canadian system has an elegant solution to, to, to propose to that. And uh, right after that workshop, um, a minister from, uh, from a developing country came to see me and he said, listen, this is really interesting. Um, could we have more information? So we'll be organizing a workshop with them and presenting what, what, what Canada is doing. Maybe you uh, tell us of, a little bit more, you, you mentioned an elegant solution. I, I'd love to hear a little bit more, maybe describe a little more about the Canadian approach to carbon pricing. Well, basically the decision we made is that um, it, it, we obviously putting a price on carbon sends a pretty powerful message to, 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 to businesses, investors, um, and, and innovators. It, it, it's, it's clearly a way to ensure that there is innovation happening in, in different sectors, in transportation sector, in, in energy sector, in various industrial sectors. But we, we didn't want Canadians to have to pay the price of, of this transformation. So we've decided to, to, to compensate Canadians for, uh, on average, for for what it's going to cost in, a, in any given province for, for, for the, the economic impact of, uh, of, of, of carbon pricing. And then it's up to the citizens to decide what they want to do. Like say they drive a very large vehicle, on average, they'll be compensated for that and it won't have an impact. But if they decide to go for a smaller vehicle 
or an EV or a mix of public transit and, and carpooling. And I, I, don't own, I, I don't own a car, I've never owned a car, but I'm part of the, 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 the Montreal's uh, Communauto car co-op system. Well, I say Montreal, but it's now uh, much broader than, than Montreal. So they could decide to change the way they do things. And all of a sudden they would have all this money at their disposal to do other things that, uh, that could be of interest for them and that wouldn't have an impact on, on, on climate change. And that's when I, when I talk about the elegant solution, and especially if you're a developing country and, and your citizens are always facing, in many cases, poverty problem, uh, access, to, access to energy, access to clean water, there is this reluctance of saying, well, we will burden them even more with that. And, and especially when you, when you think of the fact that developing countries have not contributed to, 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 to this problem by, by much. Um, so this this is something that, that that could be appealing to 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 many countries around the world, and 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 something that something that Canada will be working on to, to presenting to to some of our developing country partners this this way of of, of of putting in place a carbon pricing system. I want to come to some of the other things that Canada is doing here at COP. What are some of the priorities that you and Prime Minister Trudeau and Minister Wilkinson are bringing to this COP. What do you want to get out of this experience? Well, as, as you pointed out earlier, I have been to, to many of these meetings before, and one of the one of the most important currency in these meetings is trust. Um, the system only works if 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 enough countries around the table trust in each other that people will do what they say they were going to do. Uh, for example, in, in Copenhagen in 2009, uh, industrialized countries committed to provide developing countries $100 billion of, of funding per year by 2020 to help developing countries face the impacts of climate change. And since 2019, uh, 2009, my apologies, collectively, we, the developed world, haven't delivered on that. Uh, some months ago, the, the UK government, the, the chair of the conference, asked Jonathan Wilkinson, previous Minister of Environment and Climate Change and, and actual Minister of Natural Resources, to co-chair a working group with, with his German counterpart to try and find a solution, find a, an agreement amongst countries as to how we would get to this, to this $100 billion. And, and we have an agreement. We have a roadmap. How do we get to, to, to this $100 billion? It, 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 it's going to happen three years later than than the agreement was made in 2009, but at least it's happening. And I think that for a lot of countries here, this is a very significant step in, in, in us developed nations making good on, on, on our promise. And, and, and this frankly is one of, one of the pillars of the conference here in Glasgow. It could, if the developing world feel that, we, that we're not serious about that, it's going to be very difficult to make progress on, on, on other elements of, of the negotiations here. The other thing I wanted to ask you, we've got a number of people that are joining us from local governments, local communities. You've worked at the level, at a local level, and you have worked at that global level. And so I wonder if you can help those folks that are working at local government levels make the link. What's happening here? What can they do? What can they take away from COP that they can do and learn from in their own communities? What are the actions you want to see? Well, cities uh, are the perfect incarnation of, um, you know, this concept of think globally and acting locally. I mean, obviously, we, it doesn't get any more global than, 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 than this. We had 130 heads of state and heads of government, which is a record. Um, in Paris, I think it was 110 or 115 uh, that came here for two days right, at, right out of the G20 to, to to, to talk to, and to think about, you know, from an international perspective, like what, what does the road to, 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 to fighting climate change, to adapting to climate change, to helping developing countries look like, look like. But obviously in terms of the implementation, a lot of it needs to happen at, at, the, at the local at the, and at the municipal level, um, which is why even before I was in politics in, in 2019, I was uh, co-chairing uh, co a, a working group on climate change on behalf of the federal government with Tamara Vrooman, uh, who's now the CEO of uh, Vancouver Airport. Um, and one of the- And the chancellor we, of our university as well, which we like to- Of course, <laughs> yes, it's true. It's true. 
And, and, and one of the things we were tasked with was to look specifically in the era of transportation and, um, and buildings. What more could the federal government do? Um, which led us to, to present a report. And out of this report uh, in the 2019 budget, uh, more than $1 billion was provided by the federal government to the Canadian Federation of Municipalities to work on energy retrofit for buildings in collaboration with, with, with municipalities. Um, we were also, again, in collaboration with municipalities, working on, on deploying a network of, of charging stations so that we can electrify our transportation system um, as the, uh, if I may brag for a minute, I'm, I'm the first uh, minister uh, to have decided to go for a 100% EV as, as my service vehicle. Um, so I clearly I see the need for more charging stations uh, in, 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 in Canada, but I think as more and more Canadians turn to, to, to towards electric vehicle, it is going to, to become a necessity. And, and this is not something that we, the federal government can do on our own. Uh, we have partnership with provinces, but obviously uh, cities are, are, are at the heart of this. And I could, uh, I could point to maybe two last, or if I may, three last examples, our massive funding for, for, for transit, record level investment by our government in, in transit in partnerships. With, with municipalities, uh, the first ever uh, fund for active transportation. As someone who's worked on active transportation, as someone who practices uh, active transportation, uh, this, as an environmentalist, this is something I, I could only dream of to have a federal government that would be providing ongoing money to support uh, to, to, to support active transportation, and and perhaps the last example. Um, uh, we, we, have an, we made an agreement a couple of years ago with the city of Montreal to use infrastructure dollars to, 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 to create what will be one of the largest urban park in, in, in Canada. And we've certainly seen during the pandemic how, how uh, cherished our, our urban parks are by, by, by Canadians. And, and we were able to use infrastructure dollar money, which are normally used for roads, and bridges, and uh, aqueducts. But we, we, we did that because that park will help us alleviate the, the impacts of climate change in, in terms of seasonal floodings. So thinking really outside the box and how can we work with municipalities and how can we be a better partner, a partner to municipalities in, in, in finding together solutions on climate change. My last question to you, Minister. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau opened his speech with the um, reference to Lytton and the wildfires. You've got a lot of cities on the front end of dealing with wildfires, flooding, rising sea levels, and the heat dome. I wonder as you leave and, 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 and you think forward to going back in those first 100 days in government, what are some of the messages you want to deliver to those those mayors, those city councillors that have to deal at that front end of some pretty difficult situations right now? It's a really good question, Shauna. And one of the big elements of negotiation here at Glasgow, and it's been for many years on the international scene, is uh, adaptation for, for developing countries because they are feeling uh, the, the blunt of the impacts of climate change. But as you rightly point out, and as the prime minister uh, said in his, in his remarks yesterday, we're feeling the impacts of climate change in Canada as well. And, and, and we're certainly feeling it in, in our municipalities, which is why the federal government is currently developing uh, an adaptation strategy for Canada in partnership with municipalities, provinces and territories, indigenous people, uh, labor, business, civil society, because we, we need to figure out in, in Canada as well, how are we going to, to adapt to these things? Because it is, we've already entered the era of climate change and it's not going to go away if, even if we try to ignore it. So we, we need to find solutions when it comes to adaptation, but we need to find solutions for, for, for Canadians and Canadian cities and provinces and territories as well when it comes to adaptation. Thank you. I know that this is a tight time. You're busy as anything. I want to thank you for taking that time to finding the time to sit down with us and talk through what's going on here. Thank you so much, Minister Givo. I wish you luck. I, I, I hope that all of the Canadian negotiators 
um, are able to keep their energy up. This is a long haul and, uh, and we need some real optimism going out of this. So thanks so much for joining us. And thank you, uh, Shana. Take care. I'm gonna now turn to my uh, colleague, Jude Krasty in just a moment. Jude is going to join us and he is going to introduce us to our next speaker who will join him for a fireside chat. Good morning and good afternoon to our audience members joining us from coast to coast. My name is Jude Krasta and I will be your host for our series of fireside chats through our COP26 here in Glasgow, Scotland. We are coming to you live at 6.50 p.m. GMT, that is 11.50 a.m. Pacific, at the end of the second day of COP26, November 2nd. We would like to thank you for taking the time to be here with us wherever you are. And we are very excited to be joined today by Yunus Arakan, Head of Global Policy and Advocacy for the ICLE World Secretariat. I'll give a quick overview of, of the amazing resume that we have uh, for Mr. Yunus with here today, an environmental engineer by training. Definitely somebody you want in the blue zone, I think, very much so, yeah. Yunus leads the global policy and advocacy team at ICLE. Since 2013, he has led global advocacy towards international bodies and multilateral agreements. Yunus has helped establish the Bond Center for Local Climate Action and Reporting, Carbon N, and served as the director of the World Secretariat of the Secretariat for the World Mayor's Council on Climate Change. We are so lucky to have such a strong global figure for multi-level climate action at today's fireside chat. Good evening, Eunice. Thank you for joining us. I do. Thanks for the kind introduction and thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. So let's let's get right into it. We're we're here at the close of day two. ICLE is I mean, for, a lot, for a lot of our audience, we don't really need to say this, but ICLE is a major global player uh, on that climate advocacy for cities and regions. Uh, we've seen the work that has come out of Madrid really take fruition in some of the uh, discussions that are happening in Glasgow. You see it just naturally in, the, uh, in, in, in how world leaders are talking about climate action. So what are some of the top line priorities for ICLE in COP26? First of all, congratulations to your initiative to connect the dis discussions and so in an up-to-date round the clock and, and share it all the Canadian local government. This is a remarkable effort and I think this is to be applauded. Um, and also connecting to the to the ICLES work. Actually, uh, true, uh, we are also having a number of members. One of the strongest membership in, 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 in the world is Canadian cities and regions, uh, cities and municipalities. That's where we're proud of. But in the climate negotiations, ICLE has an additional role. Uh, so we have been following this process since 95, when the convention has first uh, entered into force, the first COP. Uh, in Berlin, that was Angela Merkel, the president of COP, uh, so time passes by. So ICLE was there, but ICLE was not there only on its own. It was on behalf of all our networks. Uh, you know, this UN processes has certain bureaucracies, and we have been following this process because we have an experience of Local Agenda 21. So we are the local government and municipal authorities constituency. FCM is one of them, of course. As of today, we have more than 30, and we are the focal point so that we communicate uh, internally, we update our members, our nef different networks, but we also connect to the negotiations, we sub submit uh, our documents, we try to influence the agenda, we try to shape the discussions and participate very actively. Uh, so this has been since 1995, as I said, together with business and um, environmental groups, local governments are the one that has been following this process since the beginning. Um, what is different now is, uh, we have made it an effort because the UNFCC and Kyoto Protocol didn't recognize local energy governments. Since 2007, we have been pushing for that. So Paris was, let's say, a milestone. There is a finally a, a direct preamble paragraph for local energy governments. And I must address that this was the last days of this Paris Agreement the crafting was in fact in Bonn, the negotiation session. And it was the Canadian delegation who put this reference to the recognition of local government. So you should be proud and we are so proud. So today in Glasgow, what are we discussing that? Having a text in the agreement is something, its implementation is different. And over these mm -hmm. years from Talano, we were always saying that none of the Paris Agreement climate goals are fit for Paris Agreement. National plans have to be revised and improved. So over these last especially two years, especially since Madrid, we have seen an expansion of this notion of let's, let's develop this national plan together with local environments. And that is a 
a tendency now uh, from US and Canada to Japan, Korea, Rwanda, to, to, to Dominican Republic. So this uh, 31st of October, which was the first day, was the World Cities Day. So we said that for us, COP26 has already kicked off with a new era for multi-level action. That's why we have announced our position and we said that um, this is now an irreversible tendency and we want every nation to embrace this as an outcome of Glasgow process. That's and, and that's absolutely wonderful to hear. And and I, I like how you're 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 making the point here that it's not enough just to ha come here, make a speech, have a pledge to something, have a plan, uh, like say that you have a plan to do something by some year. You you really want to move beyond those pledges. So when it comes to Canadian cities, we know that um, uh, as you've mentioned, Canadian cities have been a big part of uh, a lot of the work that has gone over here. They're ready and willing partners in the front lines of climate action. Many of them have declared climate emergencies, we have the Greenest City Action Plan coming out of Vancouver for the last couple of years, and the Climate Emergency Action Plan. So we have all these things going on. How can Canada's cities play a pivotal role in moving beyond pledges and plans and into real action at COP26 itself? Well, that's, I think, is a, is a question for all cities nowadays, because before Paris Agreement, as we said, it was voluntary. What FCM, what but if they Canada, this partnership for climate protection, these were all our own initiatives, just like in the era of this local agenda 21. And when local agenda 21 and Paris Agreement at the same time turned into official negotiations, sorry, official outcomes. One was the sustainable development goals, and the other one is Paris Agreement. So in fact, what we're saying that every city, every council has to commit to the goals of the Paris Agreement because we are part of the regime, we are part of the partners. Mm -hmm. So it's not that us and them, the national governments here and us here, we are part of the game. Uh, so first responsibility is uh, climate emergency declarations and commitments to uh, climate neutrality targets and developing further more ambitious 2030 targets. I think that is the most important thing. And as you have heard over these two, two years, there's a wave that's coming through race to zero, race to resilience is following up. Uh, we have to make sure all Canadian cities are, are involved in this and truly making progress. This is important because the rest of the world, this equity, this, this um, uh, front lines, and it's also in respect to the Canadian cities that they have to be demonstrating a leadership role because of the historical emissions and but also capacities. But I think we are also coming, you were just discussing the forest fires. The forest fires in Australia, in Vancouver, and in Durban, and in Turkey is not making too much difference if the capacities are weak. And in, in that sense, we have to have this multi-level collaboration so that um, the, this, this true implementation is taking place and then show solidarity with the rest of the world. I think that would be my main recommendation. Right. So I'm seeing, okay, I have two questions here. I'll go, I'll go with the first one. Let's talk about those wildfires and results. So we obviously, as you mentioned, we've had a very difficult summer. Uh, I was with Minister George Heyman yesterday for the Environmental Minister for BC. Uh, the town of Lytton, as the Prime Minister mentioned, um, existed before, but because of the fires uh, and the heat dome, um, a lot of people lost their homes, uh, lost their lives uh, across BC. Around the world, as you mentioned, many places, humans are currently affected by the climate climate crisis. So how are, my question is, how are cities working through the COP process on that resilience and adaptation piece specifically? And how uh, can we as a Canadian team, whether here or internationally uh, participating online, help play a role? Are there some goals that we can move forward and make some real progress here? So one sad reality is when these kind of disasters hit to the Western world or the Northern world, it makes an agenda, but yeah. thousands of communities have been living with these floods mm -hmm. and then disasters for years and years. Um, and, and let's take lessons learned, or let's take it from the positive side. When disasters hit north, when they started to talk about it, it also helps to the south that they, they say that, look, now you understand what we mean. We were all right. discussing about the small islands saying that, look, if we are gone, you will be gone, you will be the next. Uh, so if there's no Maldives, there's no New York. If there's no uh, Vanuatu or Port Villa, there's no uh, Seattle or there's no Vancouver as well. So I think this has been the case, for example, Germany. I mean, I live in Germany. I'm from Turkey National Enterprise, but I live in Germany for a long while. And the, 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 the 
floods, unbelievable floods that hit this country's, let's say, rural areas of just 30 kilometers was a shock for Germany. They were never think that this would come to their soil. And they, they were hopeless almost. And when we were discussing these issues, Salim Hook, a very well-known uh, scholar on, on resilience, he said that you should learn from developing countries because we learn how to live with disasters. <laughs> so you are shocked, but we are not because we have this every year or every second year. So let's take it from that point of view. Uh, the, the resilience is one of the well-advanced agendas, at least in terms of the engagement. Nairobi Work Program, for example, it was announced in 2009. It is one of the first programs that opens the door for no local and regional governments. Um, the, there is a global resilience hub this year taking place. Um, yes. Adaptation uh, fund uh, is still advancing, but it is important. So I think we should be able to show, for example, in, in, the, in the local government space, we had the urban adaptation chart in 2011. This was well, well before many others. And it was a funny story, it's not funny, let's say that, I apologize, not the right wording. But when Sandy hit New York City, it was clear New York City was not ready for adaptation, whereas Durban, the South African local government, mm. they had already their Durban climate adaptation plan. So there are a lot of things that cities and, and regions across the world can strength, can, can learn from each other, but make it much more implementable. One of the biggest challenges of adaptation is that you can never make the cost estimations correctly because there's never uh, secure adaptation. And one of the biggest uh, challenges is that there's no profitable, bankable adaptation project. So those investments, we are investing because we know that it has to be done, but we also know that it can be gone. One last example, mayor of Mozambique, Kalimane, uh, he was one of those cities who have been attending our residency these congresses he was very well trained with his staff and the city but suddenly this enormous flood came and the city is gone so all this is built in the city has to be restarted so this adaptation is such a difficult issue uh, that that we all have to be much better prepared and we have to say that look this is beyond municipal budgets that this cannot be done solved with the municipal uh, um, funding on its own therefore the whole money coming from uh, fossil fuel divestment, those monies that has to be divested should go to the sustainable urbanization and in particular adaptation so that we are all safer or at least we will feel a bit safer. Right, and so let's um, let's take a look then at, at some of the equity pieces because we're talking about bridging the knowledge and the um, and the voices from the global south with the global north and and coming together to place of this. Well, let's also talk about intergenerational equity, where people along a different time scale uh, are are dealing with consequences of past actions. Right, so um, we're seeing members from the global south who sometimes cannot be here due to visa, pandemic response, and economic inequity. There are other groups whose voices sometimes can't make it beyond the fences of the blue zone um we've and and today we've seen outside there are the protests with the, a lot of young people over there 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 is that sort of anxiety among people about like how are we being heard are, are the is the developing world being heard are the youth being heard are people in poverty or vulnerability being heard? are indigenous people being heard so what, what can cities especially canadian cities here to take ownership of action do at cop 26 and even after after COP26 to restore or um, inspire some of that faith that those who are in the position over here like to meet, discuss, to act, have those best interests of those outside the blue zone? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a very vital discussion. Um, the inclusiveness uh, is something that we really have to take care of. We have also uh, address these concerns to the presidency and the UNF secretary since the beginning. We have been talking to them uh, to the extent possible we were able to minimize these, these imbalances. Um, and that's one of the reasons, for example, as you have been to, to here, we're also connecting our pavilion in the blue zone on a fully hybrid format that the mayors and the local leaders from across the world can participate, uh, even though they are not physically here. Um, I, I think um, uh, one thing that we should be thinking about. I remember 92, um, another famous Canadian um, 
uh, Suzuki, I, I'm sure you, she would be very angry with me because she was speaker in our World Congress in 2015 in, in Montreal, but she was a speaker in 1992 in the Earth Summit. Um, and now, 25 or 30 years later, we have Greta. I remember Greta speaking in Katowice in 2018 when she was speaking on behalf of the youth groups. This is the last two minutes that we all intervene in on behalf of constituencies. And usually there are no one in the rooms. All these people are gone, so nobody hears them. That's just recorded. A year later, she came to Madrid and the, the, the doors were broken because everybody wanted to listen to her. It was, she turned into a guru. How did this happen? pressure, public participation, and that, that it is the voice of the citizens that cannot be anymore ignored. So I think the, 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 the essence is that uh, politicians are, should be feeling the demands of their communities and that they should feel that if they don't respond to those demands, they would be punished. They would not be reelected. They would not be um, uh, supported anymore. I think that is the moment we have to show across citizens, and that applies to local and provincial governments as well. Um, and, and during this climate emergency process, I think we should be proud as local governments. We are talking about 2,000 cities across the world who had adopted council decisions on climate emergency, much more than the national governments. So this is also the, the, the courage and the motivation we should tell to the young people, connect to your politics, local politics, be part of the, the discussion. And we have seen very good examples bond for future it was a result mm -hmm. of the fridays for future bond city administration offering the doors to them okay we heard you with the declared climate emergency we comment climate neutrality but we don't know how let's do it together a similar process happened in recife in brazil uh, that now the youngest brazilian mayor is from recife because recife is the first city who declared climate emergency and the recife is the first city who introduced climate into the curriculum in the Brazil, in the Recife cities, so that they encourage citizens to participate, and then they come on and, and take ownership. And we have seen so many young generations, politicians and experts coming into the power. And I think that is the good thing that we should be encouraging. But one point, when it comes to echo to discussion, that maybe I could be a bit um, challenging or provocative to the Canadian, let's say, friends, partners, um, I remember very well in 2018 when we were in Montreal, there was a very tense debate between the two provinces and the two cities in Canada, which were both members of ICLE. It was because of this pipeline discussions, how, how, how they were handling the issue. And what happened, as you can remember, the solution was that they couldn't agree. And it was the federal government who said that, OK, I take this issue myself and I will sort this out. So one of the weakness of the municipal movement, I guess, is that too much localization is also not something nice. That therefore, we need this global connection, this global movements uh, to say that it's not just national interest, it's not just local interest, it should be the global and this intergeneration. You rightly pointed out that it's not just today's futures, the futures of the, the, our generations. So maybe we should encourage this not just Canada, all local governments to be also going beyond their own self-interest that shining is not always the, what they would like to be seen of, but they should also be saying that, yes, there are things that we were not able to do. That to admit is not something bad. Maybe you can watch the video from two, yesterday, uh, the first minister of Scotland in the opening of multi-level action project, she said that we have to accept that we are not also far enough we have to be doing more and that's a good thing to say that yes we are not enough and we have to do more is something good that makes people to say that yes we could be developing together it's not that everything is done we're ready all is good and let me put the last verse in that sense another good colleague of ours um, um, uh, when we were in the negotiation of sdgs he was saying that um there is no, no country in the world which is developed when it comes to sustainability. All the nations are developing nations because all of yeah. our failing. So we should not think of this, who is to blame or not, um, uh, but it, it should be how we can do it better because the reality is that we have to build a new civilization. And this is the, the baby steps of this. And therefore we need everyone on board and we have to learn from each other.
Mm -hmm. And so, okay, in terms of uh, in terms of those those key flagship things, the things that we need to do and moving beyond, we've seen today um, one of the first flagship agreements uh, was that commitment uh, to end deforestation and do some reversal on that by 2030, I believe. So, um, similarly, um, what are uh, some top line banner commitments that uh, that ICLE is watching out for uh, for cities and local government cities regions to come out of these negotiations first of all um, our members or friends who are following the process remotely are much more advantages than those who are poor people who are waiting on the queue trying to squeeze into the rooms getting the badges because with this logistical challenges we cannot follow what's going on in the, the rooms and we're not allowed it's easier to follow online so i heard about this today this statement came one example that we were criticizing to the presidency and the secretariat, for example, and is exactly the, the theme, the biodiversity. Today, in this month, we had another COP, which is in Kunming, in China, the biodiversity COP. Uh, right. It was hybrid and it was much more virtual than it is for here. There, the heads of states have signed a declaration. Although they were remotely attending, they managed to sign a declaration from Kunming on biodiversity. Here we have 120 states. There is no official statement from the heads of state from the World Leaders Summit, but there is a side event outcome document. So if we compare, Kunming, although it was not physical, had produced a much more powerful document compared to Glasgow. Although they are here physically, they didn't produce a result. So here is lessons learned uh, that, that we should be especially in this kind of statements we have to know how it has been designed for example none of us were part of this process on especially on these world leader summits their side events there have been huge critics from the constituencies that we were not anymore the presidency of course have the right to work with some of their partners but we would expect that it would be much more inclusive but still it's in a good direction i mean we just want to be constructed to make it better that it's, the next ones could be much better prepared. So on this statement of virus, I think the thing is that the negotiations from Kunming and the, for the, uh, the climate should be helping each other. One concrete example, we are struggling in the climate negotiations to have local energy members engaged in the process. In the biodiversity, we had adopted, or biodiversity negotiators have adopted a, a decision for cities in 2008. They have adopted a 10-year action plan for citizens of national in 2010. And in Kunming, through an Adam Pro and Scottish government supported and UK endorsed process, they have adopted a second 10-year plan. Do we have this such thing in the climate negotiations? No. So there are a lot of things which we can learn from other and another lesson for the Canadians because biodiversity negotiations and biodiversity secretary is based in Montreal. So you have a responsibility, and we have the mayor of Montreal as our champion to flagship the, the biodiversity topic and all these climate agendas so we have to make sure these processes talk to each other more and the good practices could feed into the other one of the concrete things as you were asking we want a similar process coming into the climate negotiations and the one other point that we will follow very actively is the article six and that again connects to you um, urban and provincial emissions trading schemes have been developed over these years. And we want in the second phase of the uh, new Article 6, these to be acknowledged, especially for the North. And for the South, we would like to recognize uh, the non-market mechanisms that new sustainable urbanization development plans could be recognized as a non-market mechanism under the finance scheme. So that is the other point we would follow. Right, wow. Well. You have given us a lot, a lot of responsibility and opportunity for Canada cities to actually come in over here. Um, we we have now we're just at the end of day two. We have uh, we're only at November second. This goes on all the way to November um, 12th, eleventh, uh, with the uh, with the local governments uh, day taking place. Then um, there's a lot of work to be done. Mr. Yunus Arakan, thank you so much for your leadership in this space. I've I've been through the uh, multi level action pavilion, walking through. I have never seen a moment where you are not constantly over 
overworked and stressed and just put the put to your maximum limit. And I think we're all the better for it. Thank you so thank much you. for taking the time to sit just here maybe, with us. Maybe just one addition on the 4th of November, we will be again this time, we will be welcoming you into the multi level action pavilion as the Absolutely. Canadian multi level action ballot taking place. So we're also very happy to have you there. You're part of our partnership that has built this space together. This is the home of cities, towns and regions and provinces across the world. So we'd be happy to have the dialogue there as well. And we'll continue to share our outcomes and experience together. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much. You're, you're stealing you're stealing my thunder over here. I was just about to get to that. But yes, as Mr. Arakan has mentioned, we will be live at 4.30 p.m. GMT on November 4th. We will, uh, uh, the Cities and COP26 initiative in partnership with ICWI and a number of other uh, partners from across Canada and the world, frankly, um, are putting together the multi-level action uh, panel for Canada. We'll be joined by some guests from across the country including David Miller, Minister George Heyman, and a couple of others who are still being confirmed. It will be a hybrid event. There are details being posted online. Look out for those. We will be sure to share it with everybody uh, who is interested. Thank you so much, Mr. Arakan. Um, as always, we will be here daily for these briefings at 6.30 p.m. GMT. So uh, for the first week of COP26 until this Friday, that will be 11.30 a.m. Pacific, and then you can calculate down the uh, down the country. Um, and for next week, starting next Monday, because of the daylight saving time shift, it will be 1030 a.m. But that's it for us today here from Glasgow. Thank you so much to everybody who has joined us. Have a good night, have a good morning, and have a good afternoon. We'll see you tomorrow.